Welcome, my students, to Saxon Algebra 1 half. It is our very first lesson of the year. I'm so excited. Um, and I know you are too. So welcome. There are five of you in this class this year working with me, Alexis, Elsa, Joel, Jojo, and Oland. So welcome to all of you. I think you're all going to Westgate Academy, so you'll all get to know each other there. Um, but we're all gathered here together learning Algebra 1 half. So here we go. Are you ready for the very first lesson? And I'm going to start by talking about letters instead of numbers in a good way that are comfortable. Um, you guys know you learned a song, I'm sure, when you were quite young that goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. It's the letters of the alphabet, right? And those are important to learn because we use those to make words. They aren't the words themselves, but they're the symbols we use to make up lots and lots of words, right? So there's, there's a distinction between these. These we call letters. These we call words, okay? And in the same way, we use numbers like this. The numbers themselves, one, two, three, you learn these, I bet, from counting on your little piggy toes with your mom. And the one that everyone always forgets, zero, which technically should have gone first. I've written it like a phone, haven't I? Um, these are called numerals. And technically, when you were counting your piggy toes, you weren't using them as numerals, you were using them as numbers. When you counted them all up, you found out that you had 10 toes, and you had two feet, and you had one nose. Babies always like to learn about their noses too, right? This is when we took these symbols that we call numerals, and we talked about them in terms of their value. You have actually 10 toes, you could count them. So when we write them like this, this is when they become what we actually call numbers because they have value, just like words have meaning. Okay, so we wanna make, be able to make a distinction between numerals and numbers in this lesson. When we talk about the set of numbers that begins with one and just counts on, we call those the counting or the natural numbers. And I always remember that by going, it's natural to learn how to count one, two, three, four. And that's the picture of you wrapped up in a little baby towel. You probably can't see it, but I can see it. Um, wrapped up in a little baby towel, sitting on your mom's lap, maybe on her bed um, after your bath and drying you off and counting your little piggy toes, which is cute. Um, if you add the value of one to the beginning of that stream, this group of numbers is called the whole numbers. Right? The, adding the concept of zero, which came later. It probably came the first time you put your hand in the cookie jar and realized that the chocolate chips were all gone. And suddenly this concept of zero bloomed in your brain. Um, these are the ones that we spend a lot of time talking about in mathematics. We, we move past the counting numbers pretty quickly because zero is so important to us. Okay, so let me flip. I hope you're writing this all down. I meant to remind you of that. I don't care if you're, you can write it on a whiteboard. You can write it on construction paper with magic markers. I don't care how you write it, but please write this down and pause me if you need to. Okay, so what we've learned, I don't wanna draw it that way, don't draw that. Um, when we build numbers, we give each place in the potential number a value. This is called the ones place, right? I'm sure you've learned this before. Um, sometimes it's called the units place too, meaning the same thing as ones. This is the tens. 
Now I'm gonna switch to writing them as numbers because um, that gets really 100 and 1,000. It's too hard to squeeze in. This is the 1,000s place, the 10,000s place, the 100,000s place, and the 1 million. Okay, um, and then just to be consistent, I'm gonna put this here so that we can see that as you move to the left, every place value gets bigger by a power of 10, which is another way of saying we just add a zero, right? Each time we move to the left, we add another zero. So we can identify the value of different digits. So here's an example. In the number 46,235, the question asks, what is the value of the digit five? So that's the first one, that's question, that's part A of the question. Hang on, Gracie wants to go out. It's still all smoky and hazy outside from the wildfires, so I am making sure my pets get plenty of water and fresh air as much as they can. Um, one of my cats just came back. He was missing for, for 24 hours, which is a long time. They used to go out for longer when they were little hoodlums, but now they're gentlemen of an advanced, not advanced age, but they're, they're 10, which is good and old for cats. But my cat was out all night long and we were freaked out and afraid that the coyotes got him. But he came home, yay. So that's a relief. And my other cat, I have two cats. One is all black, that's Luna. These are the things you need to know. Luna is black and Sirius, Harry Potter names, is a tuxedo cat, which if you don't know, that's the kind that's black, but they have the little white chest that looks like a little white shirt and they have, um, he has little white paws and little white feet. So he looks very distinguished. I call him the professor because he looks so smart. Um, his nickname is Tuna, because, you know, Luna, but I also mostly call him Wonton, and I don't know why. He's like a little rapper. Okay, that's my pets, and Gracie. We can't forget her. I'll put her down here. Gracie is my dog. She is an Irish setter. She is my constant companion. Um, she has a lot of nicknames. I think the first one you should know is Pickles. I also call her Sue a lot, and people get confused because they think that's her name. Um, another thing I'll tell you right now, you don't, <laughs> technically I suppose you don't have to write that down, but really I do want you to know. This is called the puffy cloud of knowledge. Whenever I'm giving you a key fact or something really important that I want you to remember, I put it in a puffy cloud of knowledge. So this is a good time to introduce that idea. Okay, back to our number. Quest, part A of this question asks us, what's the value of the digit five? Well, that's so easy, it's almost hard. The answer to A is, it's five. Five units, five in the ones place, or we can think of it as five times one because that's the place it's in. The next question will be more illuminating. What's the value of the digit two? So that's question B. What's the value of the unit two? Well, that's two, but it's in the hundreds place, right? We can see that. You can refer to this if you need to. There's also a chart like this that goes on even further on page one. So um, if you ever need a little reminder of what the value of the places are, just look on page one. Okay, so back to this. The two is in the hundreds place, right? Ones, tens, hundreds. So the value of that two is actually 200. Whenever I get to my answer, I always put a box around it so that it's clear I'm done, and that's my final answer. Part C, the last part of this question is, what is the value of the digit four? See, so the four, let's see, it's in the one, ten, hundred, thousand, 10,000. 
It's in the 10,000 place. And so the value of that is actually 40,000. Can you hear her? She wants back in. All right, my princess. All right, she's trolling the kitchen for food. There isn't any, she'll find that out. Um, okay, so this is how we talk about the value of the numbers versus just the, the symbol of the numeral, right? The numeral is like the letter, the number is like the word. And that's what we talked about on the first page. All right, that's part, that's the first part of this lesson, flipping. The second part, I didn't write A for the beginning, but this is B. Sometimes John breaks the lesson up into letters. Um, and by the way, if this seems really easy to you, good, it should be. This should all be really basic review. Like I mentioned before, the beginning of every course of John Saxon is kind of like building a house where we're gonna make sure the foundation is good and strong. We're gonna get the drainage in. We're gonna make sure everything is sturdy and strong before we start to introduce new ideas um, because we don't want the foundation to crumple when we start to add weight on top. All right, B is called expanded notation. which is similar to what we just did. And we're gonna jump right into the examples in this one. No generic talk. Okay, it says write the following number in standard notation. And I'll explain what expanded notation is in just a minute. So John gives us something that looks like this. I'm copying this from the book. times. Okay. I'll give you a second to write that down. So this is called expanded notation because what we're doing is we're multiplying each numeral times its place value in order to show how the number should be written. This is called expanded notation. Okay. Standard notation is just a normal number. So when John tells us write the following number in standard notation, he just means write it like a normal number. So standard notation equals normal number. Okay? So we know, we look, John always puts them in order. He's a buddy and a pal. John is John Saxon, the man who wrote the textbook, who is my constant companion and friend, and yours too. Um, John always puts them in order. He would never mess that up for us. So we can look all the way over here on the left to see, okay, that's the biggest number. We know there's gonna be a four in the 10 thousands place. So once you get the hang of this, you don't have to write that in, but I'm going to, I'm gonna put the comma there. The four goes in the 10 thousands place. So that means that's the biggest the number will be. Six goes in the hundreds place. Ones, tens, hundreds. And five goes in the ones place. Makes sense? These show us the place where the accompanying numerals belong. Now, what do we do about the gaps? Oh, look, I did this wrong. Were you going crazy? It's a five, not a one. It was the ones place. We fill in the gaps with zeros. Notice there's no 1,000, there's no tens place. So to write it more normally, okay? If this is easy for you and you can quickly go from here to here, by all means do it. If this feels a little bit like a chore for your brain, go ahead and write out the places and do it that way. You could have always just shown me that as your answer too. You don't have to rewrite it. Okay, so we went from expanded notation to standard, and now in the next example, we're gonna go, you got it, the other way. We're gonna take this million, this number, <laughs> and we're gonna write it in expanded notation. I will be the first one to say, this is kind of a pain. It takes a lot of writing. It seems like busy work. Just relax and enjoy it and be glad that it's so easy. That's all I can say to you. So the first thing I'm gonna do is figure out what this biggest place is. And I can see by these commas that help us so much. This is, right, this is ones, tens, hundreds. 
These are the thousands, so this must be the millions. And again, page one has a full chart if you need a little help remembering what comes after thousands or whatever. Um, that's got a really great complete chart that shows all the place values. So this is one million. So I have to go six times one million, right? We put parentheses around that and then we say plus, right? I'm copying this format. Three is in the hundred thousands place, right? Thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand. Plus, now for the zero we can skip, because zero just fills in the blanks. So I can skip down here, it's five times 1,000 plus one times 100th place plus two times the tens place plus six times the ones place. That is my answer. And I just used up half the ink in my marker. But you know what? It's okay. All right. So that's the way we write the final answer. Part C. I know this is a really long lesson, you guys, because we're reviewing a whole bunch of topics. Um, reading and writing whole numbers. This is another thing you've probably spent a lot of time on. Oh, squeeze. You've probably spent a lot of time on this in the past. Um, so I don't want to belabor it. But what we're going to talk about is how you go from the number to writing it as a word. We say 23, we write 23. Um, John hyphenates these, I don't really care. Um, so harder, well, it's not really harder, but I would say this is important to understand. We might say that technically, okay, conversationally, we might say 501, okay? Or we might say 501. That's not an O, oh, it's technically a zero. So there's lots of conversational things we do that are more relaxed. But if we want, as mathematicians, which we are, you guys, you are mathematicians because you are studying mathematics with me. So that makes you a mathematician. As mathematicians, precision of language matters. We would say for this, 501. Technically, we should not say 501 or 501. We want to say 501. That's the most proper way to say it. Um, so knock the ands out and say zero, 500. No, we would just say 501, right? We don't say 501. We just say 501. Okay, I'm making this harder than it is. Um, so we're going to practice... using words to write numbers and using numbers to write words. Now, I will say this, this is kind of a pain, but it is important when we get to story problems, which we're going to very soon, to have this flexibility to go back and forth between our words and our numbers. Because when we see a number written in words, sometimes it just makes our brains kooky. Um, and story problems, we know, makes our brain make our brains kooky to begin with. So this is good practice for getting ready to own story problems. All right. I'm on the last page of the lesson, you guys, so we're getting there. This is longer than a normal lesson would be, just so you know, because we're reviewing. Okay, it says use words to write this number. And then, they're written without any commas. I'm double checking, 517-23642. Okay, so if we want to, we can add a decimal right there because we know that the, that's the end of the number, but you don't even have to do that. But what I do is I count in this direction and put commas in for every three, right? One, two, three, comma, one, two, three, comma. That helps me see the natural grouping of the numbers, right? Because this is the 
This is the beginners, right? The ones, tens, hundreds, and then we go thousands, millions, and then it would be billions and trillions. Again, the book will help you with those values, but now we have to write this out. Oh, Lord have mercy, you guys. This is annoying, and I know it's annoying, and when you're doing your homework, just remember that I have complete sympathy for you. So we're gonna write this out. 51 million, remember, every comma relates to a big category word like that, right? 51 million, 723,000, okay, 723, and then we put the thousand in when we get to the comma. And then this, this little group is always the exception to the rule. That's just a little weirdo. Um, but they're the easy numbers, so we don't mind. 642. Look at that. It took up half the page, right? That's annoying. I know, I know, I know, I know. These are not fun. You have my sympathy. Um, example five does it the other way around. He's going to give us the words and we're going to convert it to the numbers. All right. So I will read it to you and then we'll write it down. Ready? 51 billion. Okay. So I know it's going to be 51 and then billion tells me that's the first comma. 727,000. Okay. 27,000. looks like that, right? There's nothing in the hundreds place. So 27 and then thousand tells me another comma. 520. So this one was tricky. Oh wait, I did it wrong. Hang on. I fell for John's trick. 51 billion tells me that I'm going to have millions, thousands, and then another clump. So there's more zeros in here than I thought, right? Okay, so let's try it again. 51 billion, yes. 27,000. Okay, so that skips all the way down here. So that means these are all zeros, right? There's no millions at all. So 51 billion, 27,000, whoa, all the way down here, 520. Okay? So this is a great example, you guys, of why I don't like you to erase your mistakes because we can learn from them. I learned here that if I didn't plan ahead how many spaces I was gonna be using, it was easy to make a mistake. So I went in the second time and I put in all the commas. Another way I could have fixed to make sure I didn't make that mistake again is drawn blanks. Right? These would be, I, if I knew this was the billions, then I would have gone, okay, millions, thousands, basics. Um, so this isn't right, but I'm glad I can see that because it shows me that I can learn from my mistakes. All right, this is the correct answer though. And this is just another way we could have set up the problem so that we didn't make that mistake. All right, that is... The third, now comes the fourth and final part of this lesson. D, addition. I know, your brain's going, what, lady? I think I know how to add. I know. Um, we're just gonna do a little quickie review, two examples, and then we'll move on to looking at the homework. Example 1.6. Now, this is the way John wrote the problem. He tells you to add. And then he gives you numbers like this. Four plus 407 plus three. See, I said 407. That's not right. It should, I should have just said 407, 3,526. All right, he tells us to add. And he gives us the numbers in this format. Now, John, come on, you know better than that. When we do addition, we like to stack the numbers rather than write them in a line because we need to line up the places, right? 
So I'm gonna write them, I know four is just a single digit. 407 and 3000. I kind of exaggerated and spaced these numbers out, but what's really important is that we line up the columns so that we're adding the place values correctly. All right, so be really neat about that. Some students like to work their math on graph paper because it's got those little um, rows and columns. Well, it's got rows, like just like regular paper, but it's got the columns and sometimes that helps students keep their numbers neat and straight. So that's an option. Now we're gonna add, we always start over here. Oh, the names of these, the parts of an addition problem are called add-ends. It's a funky word, but it's useful to know because later when we get to other things, we'll refer to numbers as add-ins. And if you can go, oh yeah, that means addition, um, then you'll be cool. The answer is called a sum and we're gonna figure it out. All right, four plus seven plus six. You can add straight down the row or your brain can go, oh look, there's an easy 10 plus I'll add another seven. This adds up to 17. Write down the seven, carry the one, right? Uh, one plus zero plus two, three. That one's pretty straightforward. Four plus five, nine, and three. I always like to put the comma back in because it looks like a civilized number when I add the comma. Um, but they're kind of optional on thousand numbers. Sometimes people write those without the comma. So, your choice. And our final example for this extremely long and somewhat tedious lesson, it is another addition problem, but this time it's money. So again, the instructions tell us to add. I'm gonna write it down so you can see it. All right, now what you notice is that this is a dollar value and it has some sense, right? It has some change. So we've got a decimal in there. This is just an even $5 and this is nine cents. This is not even, this is a different um, category, right? This, these are dollars and these are cents. So this is completely different. So let's figure out how we're gonna write these together so we can add them properly. $2.54 is easy, okay? Five, we can also write $5 like this, can't we? I'm just squeezing in the zeros as little. So I'm gonna write the five like that so that the decimals line up, because that's the trick to adding decimals is make sure that the, the uh, decimals line up because then all the values will line up too. And nine cents, we're gonna write that as a dollar format so that we can combine this dollar format with these dollar formats. So we're gonna change the way that's written and write 0 0.09, right? This is a much more useful way to write nine cents. All right, those are our add-ends. So we will now fire away. Once you get the decimals lined up properly, you can ignore them and just add. Four plus nine, 13. If you guys, if I was with you, I'd be making you do all this adding. I have to do the heavy lifting because, well, look at the rainbow on my page from my prism. That's nice. I take that as an omen that we're gonna have a really good year. I have no doubt that we will, but that, it seems like a confirmation. All right, 13, carry the one, six, copy down our decimal, and seven. So if you were combing around your room and found some loose change in different places and added it all up, you would have $7.63, which is almost enough for two drinks at Starbucks. I don't drink coffee, but you know, that's a way to value money. So sometimes like you, uh, when I check my answer in the book and see that I got the right answer, because I have the book open right next to me, um, I'll put a star or a smiley face to show that I got it right. Okay, so this is how we're gonna review this. I want to give you some other piece of information. In this class, we, and I'm gonna say never, because in, in algebra one half, the year we'll work, the class we're working on this year, you will never use a calculator. Never, ever, ever, ever. Because calculators make our brains lazy. 
and my job is to whip, I'm the personal trainer for your math brain. Let's think of it that way. And I don't want you lying on the couch eating chips when I'm trying to exercise your brain. So that's what, that's the equivalent, what a calculator is. It's calculator is lying on the couch. It's being a couch potato. Let's just say that. Let's not drag potato chips into this. Um, potato chips are our friend, but being a couch potato is the same thing as using a calculator. It makes us lazy. So I don't want you to use a calculator ever in this class. John does a really nice job of making the numbers cute and easy to manage so that you don't have to worry about it. Okay. This is the only, today's Monday, or it should be when you're watching this, and normally I would give you two lessons, but I'm only giving you one lesson today. But you're gonna get two assignments out of it because what I want you to do is on Monday, a second. Uh, for today's homework, I want you to do lesson one, the odd problems, and then tomorrow for your second one, I want you to do lesson one, the evens. Okay, so you'll get two days out of homework out of this one massive lesson. That is because I recognize that this is a lot of work and this is a lot of information and we don't want to drown the very first day. So I'm breaking this down so that you can get two days of homework out of one day's video. Okay, so today do the odds, tomorrow do the evens, and then meet me back here on YouTube and I will give you a second lesson for two more days of homework, okay? Normally we won't do it this way, but we're starting slow. All right, I hope that's as clear as mud. If you have any questions about what you're supposed to be doing, message me, call me, ask your mom to reach out to me. That's fine too, you guys. If you wanna ask your mom, if you wanna forward your question through your mom, that's fine, I understand. Um, but it's easier if you and I work directly together because that way we don't have any communication mixes. And honestly, moms don't need to stay in the loop of all the details that we're managing. All right, I'm gonna stop talking now. Yay, we're officially begun. I will see you next time for lesson number two. Thanks.